let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I think probably all of you have heard by now, uh, Pastor Buttram, who was supposed to be here today, uh, called me on Friday and told me he had been diagnosed with COVID and that he wouldn't be able to come. So I started praying, Lord, you know what I have to do, give me the strength. And uh, so here we are. Uh, and uh, feeling, feeling I think, well enough to, to make this happen today. So you all hang tough with me here. And uh, if you want to say a prayer for, for me while we're going on, that, that'd be welcome too. So uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for once again the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you and praise you that you are faithful to us as we try to be faithful to you, Lord. Guide us and direct us now in this time and use the words that you've given me to help to further your kingdom and the word that you have for each of us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. So. Our responsive call to worship this morning, we are bound to give thanks to God for all of our brothers and sisters in the faith. The love of God draws us together and the gracious deeds of God inspire our praise. God chooses us all for salvation to confirm in us the truth of the gospel. In the glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we are tied to one another in love. God has promised to strengthen us, and we know God is faithful in all things. The Spirit of the living God is in our midst, enlivening all we say and do. Our opening hymn, Trust and Obey, page 349. smile quick 
quickly drives it away not a doubt nor a fear not a sigh nor a tear can abide when we trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey not a burden we bear nor a sorrow we share but our toil he doth richly repay not a grief nor a loss not a frown nor a cross but is blessed if we trust and obey trust and obey for there's no be in Jesus but to trust and obey. last verse in the fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way what he says we will do where he sends Trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Hear the call to confession. How often we sink into the pits of our own making. Again and again, we are snared in the work of our own hands. We become the wicked and evil people who are set, we are set to guard against. We have flawed the gifts that come from our humanity and fallen before our human frailties. Let us be honest with God and one another as we confess our sin. Holy God, we admit that we want this life of ours to go easily. We do almost anything to avoid pain and discomfort. We look the other way when people are hurting. We refuse to stand up for right, even when we hear you calling us. We like to think that we are in charge of our own lives and that we will give us all we want. Forgive our foolish understanding of you. Lift our vision and help us to discover the power to walk faithfully through every difficult moment. Amen. Here our assurance of pardon. God has chosen to save us, to deliver us from wickedness, to strengthen us in the faith, and to guard us from evil. We are not condemned to dwell in the deep mire of apathy, self-concern, and willfulness. God is beginning an abiding transformation in our midst. The Word of God will triumph in us. Sing praises to God. Let's stand for the glory of Patri.
us continue with the Apostles' Creed, uh, page 716 in uh, your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Be seated. Time for joys and concerns. Uh, would ask you to pray for Pastor Buttram. Yes, I've already told you he was not going to be able to with us this morning. Pray that that COVID will be uh, light and easy for him to get through. I know with the Pax Lovid drug, uh, mine was much easier the last time I had it, and we'll pray that for him as well. Continue to pray for Terry and his neck issues and, and uh, uh, hopefully his upcoming surgery soon to give him some relief for that. Uh, pray for Pastor and Angela and uh, as they're enjoying a time away with their family and also continue to pray for Bethany in her pregnancy. I think she had, uh, if not her first, one of her early meetings with a, um, a high-risk uh, medical person to help her hopefully through this pregnancy successfully. Uh, pray for the poor folks that went through that tornado this week and the destruction that that did. I think that's probably one of the longest living tornadoes that I ever remember. It started, went all the way across, down in the Gulf, went all the way across North Florida, Georgia, uh, South Carolina, and then all the way up to the coast, all the way up to Massachusetts before it finally gave up and a lot of damage and a lot of, a lot of heartache for the folks that, that went through that. So be sure and be in prayer for them. What else do we need to pray for this morning? Pat? I think we need to be diligently, and I mean diligently, praying for our election coming up in for everything that's going on with our government because only God should get us out of the Isn't that the truth? Yes, be praying for the election and God's, God's will in that and for a peace of mind for us regardless of the outcome. And uh, because it looks like at this point in time it could definitely go either way. So uh, be in prayer as we get closer and closer to the, to the election. Other, other prayer concerns? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we bring these to you and, and other things I'm sure as well on our hearts that we're not ready or want to vocalize. But you know, Lord, you know the things that concern us. Uh, we pray for the folks, particularly those who went through the tornado and had uh, loss of life as well as destruction of property, many of them, probably everything that they had. And we uh, can't imagine what that's like 
to have to deal with that. But you know each one, you know each situation, and you know the need. And we put it into your hands, Lord. And uh, we pray that the pastor and Angela and family are, are having a good time together, uh, spending the weekend together. And uh, Lord, we especially pray for this election cycle and for all of the, the noise that's going on with that. And pray not only for the presidential election, but also for each of the other uh, con congressional and, and uh, uh, Senate elections that will take place as well, as well as elections in each state. Lord, we need leadership that belongs to you and is listening to you, Lord. It please help that to occur so that the decisions that will be made going forward are guided by you, Lord. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we join together in the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our giving is invited because we need this discipline as much as programs need our support. Our giving is expected because we cannot truly worship God without giving concrete expression of our gratitude. Our giving is a joy to us because we have known the comfort and strength of a faithful God in whose love we can live confidently in all times and places. This is truly a high point of our worship.
Our message this morning is entitled, It Only Takes One. You've probably heard the old saying, I'm only one person, what can I do? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to start with the Bible figure of Saul, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jews. Saul was a Pharisee, the strictest and most demanding of the Jewish sects. Because Saul was so protective of the Jewish faith, he became the leading opponent of the new Christian movement, vowing to do everything he could to wipe it out and eliminate all of its new converts. As he progresses in his mission, we're going to look at three individuals that impact his effort in a significant way. As the scripture tells us, he had done major damage to the new faith in Jerusalem, hunting down and imprisoning uh, or even executing new believers. But that didn't seem to be enough. Acts 9 tells us, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way, which was what the Christians were called at that time. Then he... That he, any that he found there. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down on him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. The voice replied, I am Jesus the one you are persecuting. The first individual that God uses to remake Saul is the Lord himself. The scripture goes on to describe the impact that this encounter has on Saul. He lays in the dirt, blinded, and realizing that everything he has ever believed is wrong. He's led to Damascus to a house where he continues without sight for three days so he can ponder what's happened and where he is to go from here. During that time, the second individual God uses is a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The scripture says the Lord spoke to him in a vision saying, Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. And I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. Well, the scripture goes on to describe that Ananias knows who Saul is and what he's been doing to Christians and why he's in Damascus. And you might imagine that makes him very reluctant (laughs) to want to do what God is calling him to do. But he faithfully follows through. He goes to Saul, calls him brother, lays hands on him, and restores his sight. As a result, Saul becomes a believer in Christ and immediately begins to preach that he is the Messiah. After an extended period of study and preparation where Saul, who we know by his Greek name Paul, rebuilds everything that he has ever believed and becomes a powerful force for Christianity, converting many Jews in Damascus and elsewhere. 
he then decides it's time to go to Jerusalem and meet the apostles. The third individual God uses is described in our scripture today. So let's look at that. Acts 9, verses 26 to 28. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Barnabas was willing to stand up for Paul with the disciples and testify to his change. As a result, he was accepted by the leadership, preaching strongly in Jerusalem and was eventually launched by them to ultimately become the greatest single force for the growth of Christianity in the known world. I believe there wouldn't be Christians today, including us, if it hadn't been for Paul. But it was facilitated by three individuals, each with a designated role from God to bring Saul along step by step to where the Lord needed him to be to answer his call. The Bible's full of others. Abraham, Noah, Moses, Joshua, David, Elijah, Isaiah, the list goes on and on. Those who were willing to listen to God and respond to the call He had for each of them. But what about us? Let's come forward to our time frame with some stories of individuals answering God's call that may be more familiar to us. The first is about Reverend David Wilkerson of Indiana. You may not remember the name, but you probably remember the book in the movie, The Cross and the Switchblade. God called Wilkerson from his local church to go to New York City to try to make contact with one of the gangs. Can you imagine that? <laughs> what do you think your response would have been? But he, he did. He responded in faith. He was able to get into one of the most dangerous gangs in New York called the Mau Mau's led by the notorious leader, Nicky Cruz. Through the miracle of God, Wilkerson eventually converted Cruz with prayer and faith, helped him out of his drug addiction, and used him to help others and spearhead a powerful ministry organization to addicts and others called Teen Challenge that Wilkerson founded. It's reached thousands with healing and is still active in ministering today, 60 years later. Plus, Cruz himself became an evangelist, speaking and converting member, many. I attended one of his crusades years ago. A story only God can write. The second story is about Reverend Bob Harrington of Alabama. God called Harrington to go to New Orleans and begin to show up in bars 
and preach and witness. It may sound crazy, but Harrington listened and did. And through God's touch, he was so effective at reaching people with the gospel that the people in New Orleans began to try to find out where he was going to be next so they could go and hear him. It grew into a national ministry. And Harrington did crusades all around the country. He brought his crusade to Chattanooga in the late 60s. Pastor Phil preached a sermon on faith a while back, and he talked about intellectual faith as one kind. And I realized at age 25 that though I'd been in church all my life, intellectual faith was all I had. I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. So I began a search that led me to Harrington's crusade. I went several nights that week, and he brought me to a full spiritual heart faith for the first time. Since we're not pastors, these stories are powerful works of God, but probably hard for us to relate to. So story number three is hopefully a little closer to home for that we can connect with a little better. I was on the board of a crisis pregnancy center for years in New York. And one, at one point, we were working with a group from Watkins Glen, New York, to open a satellite office. We'd been having some planning meetings with our board and volunteers with the Watkins group. After the meeting, I noticed one of our volunteers was talking to one of the Watkins group very seriously. After she finished, I went over and inquired about the conversation. It seems that the lady that she was talking to was a former exercise instructor of hers. In the course of catching up, the lady informed my friend that since their last encounter, she had become a Christian. When I asked how that came about, after some thought, she said, you know, I guess it started one night after class when you asked me what would happen if I invested as much in my spiritual conditioning as I did my physical conditioning? The question stuck, and God drew me from there to become a believer. So what about all of us? This last story seems to hit a little closer to where we all live, doesn't it? Though we're never going to touch thousands of lives, there's a very good chance we're going to touch individual lives, like my friend. How do we do that? By staying open to those quiet leadings of God in our hearts as we have ordinary conversations with folks we know. As we connect with others, we have many opportunities, especially when they're troubled or have needs, to reach out with our words or our actions as God directs. Notice I said, as God directs. It's not our job to be the fixer but to be the conduit that God works through to do what He knows needs to be done at that time. Colossians 3.12 says, As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
These are the qualities Jesus wants us to emulate from him and live out. We are simply to see other people as he did. And then with the same heart as his, let him act through us. Colossians 4, 5 says, Be wise in the way that you act toward others. Make the most of every opportunity. Have you ever thought of an early con earlier conversation and said to yourself, Boy, I wish I'd have said such and such. The only way we accomplish that is to listen to those whispers from God that guide us to the right thing at the right time with others. So, forget about the line, I'm just one person, what can I do? It's not just you. It's you and God. And He'll provide whatever you need to answer any call He makes on you. We just have to be willing. Let's pray. Lord, open us up to this idea and this possibility that we are, in fact, your representatives everywhere you, we go. And sadly, we don't always think of that. But in fact, you are our guide and director and encourager to be your hands and feet in the world around us wherever we are and whatever we're doing. And that with us, you can accomplish many things on your behalf in the lives and situations of others. And so we ask you, Lord, to be in our hearts and minds as we go from here today, to be your representatives wherever we go and whatever we're doing. In Christ's name, amen. So, I, uh, I've had a couple of experiences where uh, I believe that I've experienced what I believe music will be like in heaven when we get there. The first one was in a uh, Promise Keepers years ago in Syracuse, New York with 50,000 guys singing Amazing Grace. And this morning our closing hymn is the other one of those for me. Pass It On was the theme song for our walk to Emmaus up in New York. And I've sung Pass It On hundreds of times with a group of 300 or so at, a, at a walk to Emmaus closings. And I, uh, I know that it's the word for all of us this morning to end this service. Pass it on, page 309. <laughs> a spark to get a fire going and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing that's how it is with God's love once you've experienced it you spread his love to everyone you want to pass it on what a wondrous time is spring 
when all the trees are budding the birds begin to sing the flowers start their blooming that's how it is with god's love once you've experienced it you want to sing it's fresh like spring you want to pass it on i wish for you my friend this happiness that i found you can depend on him it matters not where you're bound I'll shout it from the mountaintop I want my world to know The Lord of love has come to me I want to pass it on Now Let's close with a prayer asking God to take us out this week and use us and make us aware of those times and opportunities that He's providing for us and trust in Him to be the guide and director for how we approach each of those. Let's pray. God be with you till we meet again. Bless us, Lord, as we go into your world, as your people doing your work in the way you would have us, and being the voice and the arms of love for Jesus Christ in each part of the world we touch. In Christ's name, amen. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels guide uphold you. With his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Neath his wings protecting hide you. Daily manna still provide you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.